way into that red car stop. Yeah, you know, they were going to be down there. I said, well, you're not going to see that, but you watch us play, and you'll see us hit, and you watch us play, and you're going to see the strongest group of guys working together that you'll ever see. So they came down, and they videoed us, and they shot us. I should have brought the thing. I didn't realize. It's seven minutes long, and they used it on national TV. But the idea was this. These guys, everything from pie-eating contests to tug-of-wars to all the things we do, 20 different activities, they have so much fun and pull together in all these different groups. We take 80-some guys, we have 10 on a team, eight, eight different teams, and we play all kinds of things. And they do skits, and we have this, and we go to the, we got this Izzy Dizzy, you've all done the Izzy Dizzy thing, bat on your head, you know, it's been around 12 times, go down around the cone, except we do it out in the ocean. And I'm telling you, they get out there and they get just, oh, we have a ball out in the ocean. Only trouble is the coach's team has to do it every year, and we're not very good at that, and they love that. But you're making your players get together and have some fun working together so that when they get on the field, they can then, that carries over into the team building that you've had that you want to do for a football play for that's going on the field. Believe me, it works. It really works. When Bear Bryant was in the twilight of his career, he was as tough as they come, as you know that. In fact, the classic story of Bear Bryant, to show you how tough he really was, uh, they were playing Georgia Tech, Alabama was. And Alabama was ahead of Georgia Tech, 18 to 13. Let's see, five, six, eight, yeah, five points, 18 to 13. And Alabama had the ball in the Georgia Tech 15-yard line. Less than 30 seconds left to go in the game. Sent his backup quarterback in. Backup quarterback went in the game, and he said, okay, son, you're getting a chance to play now. All you got to do is hand off, and a couple plays, the game's over, but at least you get in. Well, the quarterback got in the game. You know, he's all excited on the 10-yard line, and, and, and uh, he got the ball. He missed the handoff. And he goes back, and he, he tries to drop back. He's starting to scramble a little bit, and there's, there's his wide receiver wide open in the end zone. So his eyes light up. He's going to score a touchdown there. So he throws the ball. But the free safety watched him all the way and went across the front and picked it off in the end zone. And started down the sideline. It's going to be a 105-yard interception return for a touchdown. Now, this, this free safety runs about a 4-6. This reserve quarterback runs about a 5-1. I mean, there's not a chance. The reserve quarterback tackled a guy on the five-yard line as time ran out. And the Georgia Tech coach could not believe this. So he starts across the field, and Bear Bryant meets him in the middle, and he says, Bear, this is the most amazing thing I ever saw. He said, we had that game on you. He said, my kid, there's no way your kid was going to catch my kid before he scored. My kid runs 4-6. I know your kid doesn't run in a five flat. Bear <laughs> said, that's easy. Your kid was running for a touchdown. My kid was running for his life. <laughs> so Bear Bryant put the fear of God in all these players. But in the twilight of his career, he went through a total turnaround because he realized something that challenged him in coaching. You know, he used to couldn't Alabama, never sit down, helmet never went off, never got any water, you're a man. Until he had a kid almost die on him of heat prostration. And all of a sudden he started listening and realized, wait a minute, practice breaks are important. It is important that you, you go down to a knee. It is important you take your helmets off. It is important that you, you have water. So he had regular practice breaks in his practices the last years at Alabama, and of course the players were just totally involved in that. So my point is this that when you learn how to build these things in to this team building activities, it makes a difference. Now, I've had a lot of high school coaches say, but Frosty, we, don't have, we could never do that. I said, well, why don't you have a uh, morning practice and run your dog patch Olympics in the afternoon? Or why don't you have an afternoon practice, cut it short and have your dog? I said, you can do it anyway. Stay all night in the gym. Have your moms come and, and cook, a, cook breakfast for them. I said, you got to be creative. But listen, to go on a breakaway or make a breakaway with your team during the early part of the season is one of the greatest team building things you can do. And you can pick your activities from shooting hoops to, to doing whatever you want with football guys, and they love it. They love it. And all of a sudden, when they come together to learn your X and O's and all the stuff that you do, there's a different team feeling there because they've learned to put this together in a way they're not afraid anymore. You know, all of us fall down, and we have to bounce back up. And probably, you know, they, they ask uh, Paul Harvey, you know, if you had to give advice to anybody in a one-liner, what would you be? He said, get back up. Get back up, because you're going to get knocked down. And so years ago, a guy came around and made a talk, and I never forgot this. And you, This little nut in the jar is one of the classic stories of football, of life, of anything. 
And this little nut in the jar has saved the lives of kids because we have an outreach program for over 800 kids with our football team. We go to an elementary and a middle school, and it's down in the lower socioeconomic part of Tacoma, and the kids, there was truancy, there was calligraphy, I mean, there was uh, all kinds of stuff all over. Not calligraphy, what? <laughs> graffiti, there we go. <laughs> Not calligraphy, graffiti. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> all over the place. They didn't care. Windows broken, they didn't care. A PLU principal got to school and he said, Frosty, will you come help us? That was 15 years ago. We took our team 80 strong down there. I said, just have the kids' name tag on. Kids love to be called by their name. Jimmy, Johnny, Susie, Mary, whatever it is. I said, our kids are going to come down and sit down with your kids, and they're going to visit with them and call them, and they're going to do some stuff and, and, and let us get started. That started 15 years. We've got our own playbook now for those schools, and these kids just look forward to our kids coming and working that little playbook out. They color pictures. They write one-liners. They do these little challenge things, and oh, they're so excited. And they score points each week, and then the kids that score enough points get to come to our games. The kids got so good, they had to have another one. So then we said, okay, you can come out on the field with us during pregame warm-up. We had to have another, you can come in the locker room. Oh, these kids were doing it. We couldn't get enough. Some of them were so hungry to get involved with this stuff. But they never forgot this story. And the story is so beautiful. And here it is, in a nutshell, no pun intended. Peanut butter jar is the world we live in, and the beans are the things that happen in our lives, the goods and the bad, highs and the lows. And the walnut is us as a person. Now, if you're having any fun in life, you ought to be a little nutty. I mean, that's what it is. We can laugh, and you don't have to have booze to have fun. You can have fun doing some natural things in life. Natural highs are all around us once we understand that. But what I'm trying to say is you're on top, and when you go home from this clinic, you're going to feel this way. But when you get back home, things start happening, and they aren't all the best. And so all of a sudden, you get hit in one of these things each day, and boom, down you go. Everything from your kids getting sick to uh, bang up the car to all the kinds of things that happen in life. You get down. Now, when you get down, if you're driving the red car, you're uptight. You're mad. You're ready to point fingers, and you're going to get this thing solved. But that really isn't what it's all about. Because here's where you start pointing fingers at other people, blaming other people, getting up tense, being cynical, all this stuff, you know, the ones going to the dogs and everything. But you see, when you get in the blue car, there's another game coming, because now you realize this happens every day in our lives. We don't score, we have fourth down. And now we've got to get the job done. So when we do that, we start to pull together. We start to affirm and encourage and make each one give it the best shot they got. And all of a sudden, you bounce right back to the top, and you get down again. No big deal, because now we got to, this shows who we are. We got knocked down, and now we got to get back up and we bounce back. Now I could do that two or 200 times, three or 300 times, but the bottom line is, you can never keep a good person down. Boy, does that hit home. Word go down, you go down. Sure, your kids go home to tough home situations. They wash their feet with you and then they go home and put on dirty socks. I mean, it's a sad state of affairs. One, one uh, parent families, no parent families, home's a place to eat, sleep, and get out of, and you got them. And so they know this is what's gonna happen. But they've got the tools that you've given them to bounce back through your football that helps them to live life and develop some qualities. A young man was going to commit suicide, and the counselor got wind of it. He got in his car, took the nut in the jar, and drove down to where this kid was. He found the kid, and the kid said he'd talk to him. And he set the nut in the jar right over by the side, and he started visiting. And the kid saw the nut in the jar, and our players, we've got nuts in the jar with every teacher in these elementary and middle schools. And he remembered this story. And all of our guys tell this story, and the kids will come into the teacher's desk in the morning and say, teacher, you know, last night wasn't so good, but I know this. I can make it a good day. Now, those are young kids. Well, anyway, here's this kid over there, and the counselor's talking to him, and all of a sudden, he's, he said, son, do you remember the nut in the jar? And the kid says, yes, I do. So as soon as he took the jar, he said, this is me right now. He said, the world, you know, I don't care. I don't care about nothing. Things have happened in my life. Nobody cares about me, and, and I'm just, I've got to get out of here. But you know something? I never forgot when the PLU team was here, and one of their guys got up in front and said, you know, this changed my life. Because I know that just because I'm down, I'm not really down. When people care about me, I can bounce back, and I'm going to do it. Set the jar down, thank the counselor. The guy came back to school. 
and he made it. Ended up graduating from school and going on to college. But he tells that story of what the simple little nut in the jar did. It's an object lesson, and we're all looking for it. Whether it's a car we're talking about, whether it's this thing we're talking about, we're talking about helping people learn how to need each other. And that's what we do as coaches. So the breakaway experience can be a little small thing, or you can make it into a big thing. If you want to know more about that, just get in touch with me. I'll share the video with you or anything. I mean, I know some of you, I know you say, that sounds good, Frosty, but it's not for me. I understand that. That's why you come to these clinics. You get ideas and you go home and some you'll try, some you won't try. But boy, you get frustrated. Oh, you get frustrated. You say, boy, next year is going to be different. You know, uh, let me share this, this situation. I tell a lot of stories. I'm sorry about that. But stories seem to me to be the best way. I, I'm a Midwesterner, Iowa, born in Iowa, coached in Minnesota a lot, you know, and had a great chance to be. And I coached in, in the Midwest for about 16 years. And one year I was selected, I was a baseball coach too. I got to coach baseball. And we had a lot of excellent baseball teams. And so one year I got to coach a college all-star team of players from Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois. And we were the eighth team in a pro league, a class A pro league, with seven other teams. But they all had drafted players. They'd all signed contracts. My guys were college players. Well, we hustled and worked at it and everything, and we started to play. We played 10 games, and we were 0-10. I mean, it got blown out, 18 to 3, 15. We weren't even in the games. And I'm thinking, holy Toledo, this, you know, what are we going to do? So it got rained out on 11th night. <laughs> so I had a victory party. We, we didn't play that night, see? So I got them together, <laughs> and we got in a pizza, and I said, guys, we're going to make some changes. Now, that's the understatement of the year when you're 0-10 and you haven't been in the ball game. So I looked at our three pitchers. I said, okay, you three pitchers can play in the outfield. You're going to see what it's like to have those bombs come you've been throwing the last 10 nights. <laughs> so the pitcher, yeah, okay, we'll go in the outfield, see? I had this catcher from Iowa State, John Stewart. I said, John, you're going to pitch. Listen to what he said. He said, Frosty, ought to pitch. I'm throwing it back harder than the pitchers are pitching in there anyway. I said, okay, John, you can pitch. Well, I changed every guy on the team around, except I had this third baseman from Illinois, Rod Schock. I said, Rod, you're going to play first base. Here's what he said, Frosty. I've always been a first-name coach. It's no big deal. I've always been Frosty. The name stuck years ago, and I've always kept that. But he said, Frosty, I can't. I said, why not? He said, because when I was a little kid, two years old, my mom and dad taped a little diamond in our kitchen. And dad put me over on third base, and he got on first, and mom got up to bat with a little plastic bat and a puffball, and she'd hit this little ball down to me. And I'd scoop it up and throw it to my dad. I started doing that when I was two. Then I played Little League third. Then I played high school third, and I played third in Illinois. I said, Rod's first is just like third, except it's on the other side of the diamond. He said, but Frosty, when the game starts, I get so psyched. I just play by habit. I said, don't worry, Raj. Habits are the same. He says, okay. So the next night came. Now, we're all fired up. Our pitchers are all in the outfield waving to the crowd. They're going to play a while tonight. They're not pitching. See? <laughs> My catcher throwing aspirin tablets in there. I mean, he's really, oh, we're going. So the game starts. My catcher strikes them out, one, two, three, and we jog off the field, tied in the first inning. First time in 10 games we've ever been tied in the first inning. We got them out. It's goose egg, the first inning. So we come up to bat, and they're pitching a former St. Louis curveball. He strikes us out, one, two, three. We're used to that, so out and field we go, see? <laughs> now the play happens, and that's why I'm sharing this with you. This is a classic. Their first guy in the second inning gets a big left-handed cleanup hitter. My catcher's been throwing all fastballs. Decides to throw him a curve. Now, curveball, right-handed pitcher, the left-handed batter, breaks from the inside corner. Most of the time, you hit it straight away, it goes down to first base. So here comes the pitch. Wham! Line shot, right at old Raj. He goes up in the air, makes a super play. Doesn't catch it, but knocks it down. Another inch, it had gone to the wall for a triple. But there the ball lays 15 feet away from first base. Now, all he's got to do is pick up the ball and step on the bag. The guy's out by 80 feet. But all he can think about is throw this guy out. So he gets the ball and turns around and goes to fire it across the diamond. Now, my center fielder's now playing third base, see? And he looks at Raj and can't believe it. So he starts waving to Raj to get on the bag. Raj starts waving to him to get on the bag. The rest of my guys just watch. Nobody does anything. And these two guys waving. I realize Raj is psyched out, totally psyched out. So the runner's cut. It's going to be a close play now, see? So I come out of the dugout and I'll Raj, he looks at me, his eyes are big as silver. I said, the runner. He looks at the runner. Now, being a third baseman, all he can think is run down. So as soon as step on the bank, he starts running the runner. The guy starts back to home. That's right. <laughs> We've got him in a rundown play between first and home. <laughs> the craziest thing you ever saw. My team's all on, get him, Raj. Get him, get him, get him. Crowd's cheering. Um, what kind of team is this? I'm hiding in the dugout. Oh, it's embarrassing. Three or four relays, finally, Raj goes for the guy. Chased him all the way to home, dies with the guy. Guy slides in the home, and I'm you're safe. <laughs> safe, he hadn't been to first base yet. Oh, the frustration of baseball. My last baseball coaching assignment, I'll tell you. You can kick dirt and everything. At least football, you can go hit somebody. 
But it was very frustrating because we weren't doing anything because the habits that we had before. So that's what I'm trying to talk about this team building thing. Some of the habits we've had, if we will break away into some of these other things, the kids start having some fun and they'll go out and play tough football and they'll respond in so many ways because you really cared about them and it makes a big difference. You see, every month our football team gets together. We go bowling, we go swimming, we have inner tube relays, belly flop contests, whatever you can make up, we'll try to do. We get in the gym and play hoops, you know. And, and we have all these, and they love getting together, not to train and get stronger for football. They do that tremendously. But because being together means so much, and it's a basic need of belonging. Now, they can have other friends, but they ought to have friends on the football team. And that means your seniors need to cultivate friends with your younger players and not act like they're the top of the rung and nobody else can touch them. And too many seniors get that senioritis feeling. But when you bring it in and you start to help out, the other thing your players can do is start to help young kids. If you want to help them to help somebody else, get a grade school and go down and, and, and start a little, little Saturday clinic or do something. And when your players are doing something for somebody else, it comes back a hundredfold. My mom's mother always said, cast your bread upon the water and it comes back with strawberry jam. I like that. Because when you help others, things happen you don't even intend to have them. And it just happens because people start feeling that way about things. So my point is tonight, the breakaway idea, however you view it, as little or as much, makes a big difference in this, making the big time with your team and making them feel good about where they are. Okay, now let's talk about goal setting, how we do this. In goal setting, I, I've, I've been to so many goal setting seminars, I've listened to people talk about goal setting, and I think they miss the target. We're going to talk about a different kind of goal setting here, because this is the kind of goal setting that everybody can accomplish. It isn't something you've got to get to, it's something you're going to start doing right now. And the more goals you hit, the more confidence you get, the more confidence you get, the better your best shot gets, and pretty soon you're out there being the best a lot of the time that it's just happening to you. You don't have to worry about it, getting psyched for the best game. In fact, psychologists say this, many teams do not play the best at their best game because they do the one thing they think they're supposed to do to play better, and that's try harder. But it isn't trying harder. Because when you try harder, you now become very mechanical, very, very methodical. The term now is in the zone, isn't it? When you're in the zone, you're just flowing. It's just happening. Momentum comes. We're such a momentum team. We got this idea of the big five. Take this idea with you. It's a great one for football. When we score a touchdown, our whole student body, everybody stands up and puts a big five. And they chant the big five, the big five, the big five. They got a couple. Now, the big five has scored two touchdowns in five minutes. And it all starts on the next kickoff. So they look at the clock, and we just scored. Now the next is to get another touchdown in five minutes. You know how many times we've done that? Last year, we scored 16 touchdowns in five minutes. Now that doesn't just happen. It's a psychological thing. When that, you know, many times we've gone down the kickoff, hit, caused a fumble, got the ball back, and my gosh, in two minutes, we scored another touchdown. Now it doesn't always work, but it's an exciting when you got this big five idea of the idea that, boy, we're coming out there and our guys are, are we're all, it starts with the defense, and the defense builds that. And of course, with the rule now of picking up a fumble, see, we got these seven keys of defense, and the last key of our defense is score. Score on defense. We're not a passive defense, we're gonna score. And we had a play happen last year where the quarterback went back to pass, and we had a stunt, a twist stunt on the outside, and our guy came inside, and the quarterback's arm got hit, and the ball popped up in the air, the defensive end got it and ran 60 yards for a touchdown. Biggest thrill of his whole career. But he caused that to happen, and the defense, of course, rallied around him because it was score on defense, the number seven. So I'm trying to say here that this idea of goal setting is very interesting. So let's take a look at it. Here's a typical goal setting session. Long range goal. Okay, long range. Intermediate goal. Okay. Short range goal. Okay. Now. Get a plan of action, and let's, let's get at this, see? And that's, that's how you're supposed to do this. This is the standard goal-setting procedure. Long range, intermediate, short range. Plan of action, let's do it. You know what I found happens so many times? I say, well, we got some of the short ones. A couple of these never got these. Never made the long ones. In fact, we didn't even know what, pretty sure we were so tied up in this. I said, well, that's interesting. This is the road to success. It's all red car thinking. But get in the blue car and watch what happens. We don't even use this term, long range. We don't even use the term goal here. These are visions and dreams. These are things we dream about. These are things we vision. This is down the road. 
These are out of sight. You can't even see them, but not out of mind. Visions and dreams of your own program, what you'd like to see it be and all that. Uh, Lou Tai started the Pacific Institute quite a few years ago, and Bob Moad, they were two former coaches, and, and they got together and put some sports psychology stuff together. And now he's head of Nordstrom. He trains all the Nordstrom people and everything. But he had a little thing with the cards, the three by five card, you know, write on the card what you want to be, put it up in your bathroom, look at it every day, and you'll become that. Well, they say, what do you write on it? Well, you all write the same thing. State champion, all state, all conference, all this, all that. Well, how many made it? Well, maybe 5%. But you're still supposed to think it. I never bought into that. I thought, what, what a tragedy to try to say that. You say, well, you got to think big. Sure, you got to think big, but you got to learn how to think big and not put people on here. Well, three out of 100 made it, and the other 97 didn't even have a chance because it was not a realistic thing. And they said, well, you got to think it if you're going to be it. Let's show you how to think it. You have these visions, a dream of becoming the very best you can without even knowing what that is. And so many things in life come to us in such mere ways. The second one here are desires. Intermediate goals are desires. They're out of reach, but not out of sight. Out of reach, not out of sight. We can see these things, but we haven't got them yet. Desires, not intermediate goals. I got some desires. I'm going to reach that. And the third one, the short range, are goal sets. And goal sets are do it nows. Do it nows. We'll do it today and we will make it happen. Now, this, my challenge to this is this. You must build some desires from the visions and dreams that you have down the road. But basically, you build some desires and then you goal set to reach them. And these goal sets are things you do every day or so many times a week to help you reach these desires. So you stretch yourself to do these things. Now you say, well, Frosty, how's that apply to football? Let me show you. We have a goal sh sheet. You know, I come to these clinics, and I, if you're interested in any of this stuff, I'll be glad to send it to you. I've got these attitude games written out. I've got all this stuff. But you've got to take the initiative. You've got to send it to me. Just give me something. If you want it at the end of this, give me your name and address, and I'll send it to you. Not, no big deal, but I just want you to know that. But we've got the neatest goal setting. We've developed these over the years. These are weekly goal sets, and there are four categories. The first is attitude. The second are skills and systems. The third is fitness. And the fourth is team building. OK, we have these four categories each week. Now, we have a little box here. Players can't write very much. See, kids aren't going to write very much. So you don't expect them to write very much. You learn how to pigeonhole it. Okay. So here they list their desires, and here they list their goal sets. How are they going to do that this week? Let's put an example here of fitness. Now, we do not force players to run. We believe physical punishment is the worst way that you try to, to motivate a player, and yet every, so many do it. You know, run laps, do push-ups, sit-ups. I did so many thousand push-ups in Marine Corps, you know, uh, you know it ended my push-up career. But the idea is that it isn't a physical game. You want them to do push-ups. You want them to run because they know the pay value of that is they're getting stronger, they're getting faster, and they've chosen to do it. You see, goal sets are choices. You're choosing. This is a choice. You're not making them do this. They're choosing to do this. So what you have to do then in each of these areas, you develop lists. Lists under attitude. Things they can do under attitude. You have about 25. Things they can do under, under your system. Let's say your system of play or your skills. So for the offensive linemen, you've got all these skills, the offensive linemen, defensive linemen, linebackers, running backs, quarterbacks. You've got all these skills that they try to do. Now, you do these drills in practice, but it's different when they choose to do them. Remember, you have them do them. But now I choose this week to do this skill six times before practice. We start practice with goal sets. Practice begins, and, and everybody's out there goal setting. It looks like a three-ring circus. For 15 minutes, guys are doing all kinds of skill and system goal sets. And then, but the players, and it has to be measurable. And goal setting, there is a great acronym for this called Goal Set Smarter, Not Harder. Let me share this with you because this is really good. Smarter. We're always talking about doing things smarter today. First, you've got to be specific. 
you got to be very specific. The nose of the ball, not the ball. The, uh, the U in USA, not the whole sign. You are looking at specific things. The M is measurable. I got to measure it. I got to be able to measure it. I'm going to do it so many times. I'm not just going to throw the football around. Receivers with us have goal sets anywhere from 50 to 125 catches per day during practice. And some of them go out there at the end, there's nobody, they throw the ball themselves. They throw the ball over their shoulder and run and catch it themselves. They measure so many catches. We have guys hitting the machines. They go out there, they've got to get six hits on our one man, one man, hit it, drive it, put it down, and put him down. Six of those. So anyway, you've got to measure it. It's got to be attainable. It's got to be something you can attain. It can't be way out there. This is success road. I can do this today. If I make up my mind to it, I can goal set and make this happen today. It's got to be relevant. It's got to mean something. I can pick 100 bricks over here and move them over here and then move them back. It doesn't mean much. I may get a little stronger, but it's got to be relevant. That's why in your skills and systems, the thing, you all do seven on seven. Seven on seven is a great deal, but it depends on how you run seven on seven. Or five on five pass rush. When you got that going, it depends on how you run that. And so all of a sudden, it's got to be relevant here. It's got to be timely. It's going to take time. You have to be able to understand this is going to be timely. It's going to take part of your day to do this. It's going to take extra effort. And the last is, I've got to learn to revise and renew these as they go down the road. Boy, that, this is strong. This helps guys goal set and keep on the mark. Always we respond to our guys, be more specific. How many times? When are you going to do it? And when you do that, as they get back to this part of the goal setting thing here, we're asking here on goal set, they got to put how many times? Six times. Like on, on team building here. Bottom, you say, well, it's kind of relevant, isn't it? They do it all the same. No, there's a lot of six put ups today. I got a lot of ways I can put people up. One of the neatest things I've had slid into my door, I keep all these notes my players send me over the years. I got lots of them. And one of them says, uh, one night we got the Tacoma Dome. It's an indoor facility. We're going to play there this week, and we couldn't get into practice. But they rolled the tarp out and they got it in, and the guy I know real well, he called me and says, Frosty, we can get in at midnight. So we put a phone call out to our players and said, guys, we can have a pizza hut, and a, uh, we can have a pizza night and practice at midnight. We'll meet you at the gym at 11.30. They all came down. We had an hour of practice. Had a great time. Practicing in the dome, you know. Next morning under my door, I said, Frosty, you're a stud. Gosh, that was neat. To a player, that means a lot. I did that with our president. He called me up and says, is that good? I mean, what's that mean? I said, no. <laughs> I said, in coaches talk, that's the best. But the idea here is that we're talking about doing these things specifically in each of these areas. But you've got to build things. You can't just say, what do I do about attitude? You've got to give them some things here, and they can choose from them. Skills and system, you've got to give them some choices. They can do them. Fitness. Our guys work more. They don't have to weight train. They weight train harder and better than, and you have to have the other thing with this, some other player to keep them accountable. You can't do it by yourself. So they have to put a buddy down below that makes them accountable to do these things. I'm telling you, men, it works. Not with college kids. High school coaches in Washington are doing this and making it work. And they said, Frosty, our guys are doing stuff they've never done before because they chose to do it. You got my picture there? They chose to do it. Now, they don't always like to do it, but they want to do it because they're learning what goal setting is. Goal setting is getting you a target, and then you start to shoot your way right to that target and make it happen. Oh, I may be running out of time here. What we done at seven or? Okay, got a few more minutes. I hope you understand this, man, but this is taking goal setting. Now, we're not goal setting to win the game. We're goal setting to be the best we can and we go on the field. The greatest thing that can be said about your team is be careful when you play them because they're not going to beat themselves. And if they're not going to beat themselves, look out because they're going to be out there on that field making things happen and it makes all the difference in the world. And that's what I guess I'm trying to help you understand today. It's an attitude. The big time is an attitude. You know, I spoke to a junior high coach, and, and uh, he came up after me. He said, Frosty, I hear all that you've said, and I really agree with a lot of that. And he said, but I'm just a junior high coach. I said, wait a minute. Let me tell you something. Have you got a minute after we're done? He said, sure I have. I said, let's go get a Coke. He said, I'm a Pepsi guy. I said, okay, let's, whatever. Be, be my guest. So we sat down together. How, how about that latest Coke Pepsi commercial where the Coke guy goes and reaches over into the other one, the whole thing falls down? I mean, that's a winner. That's a real winner. Never mind, I'm not a commercial guy. But, <laughs> but anyway, so, um, oh, I lost my train of thought there. 
Go and have a Coke, junior high coach, yeah. We sit down and I said, you know, you've got the greatest coaching job in the world because you can affect kids now. Kids are going to drop out, fall through the cracks, and if you can keep them out for your football team, it makes all the difference in the world. And let me tell you the classic experience of our